Okay, so we are going to continue with talking about fluids as we introduced on Wednesday. And as you can see here, Archimedes' principle is the goal. So I got a couple pictures, obviously fictional pictures, about Archimedes and his use of California's state motto, Eureka, which means, of course, I have found it. Because once you found California, well, you know where the promised land is. So we'll get to that in a little bit, but just the picture. One of the things that's important to, to note from this picture here of the dam holding back the water is that it doesn't matter how far back the water goes, if it's a really big lake or a really small lake. If the lake's only six inches wide and 100 feet deep, it's going to have the same pressure at the bottom. Right, because the pressure is only a function of depth, not of the total weight of the water. This leads to interesting things like, um, this is actually a famous experiment. A person took a wine barrel and put a tiny little tube in there. Okay, it's supposed to be tiny. And nobody believed him, but he poured water in that tube and burst the wine cask with just a small weight of water. How can a small weight of water burst the wine cask? Because the pressure is going to be, you know, the density of the water times that height times G. It doesn't matter how much water is in the tube. It can be super narrow. You still build up an incredible pressure by just having that very small tube of water and thus bursting it because you have that pressure puts a force. Oh goodness. I was going to bring out a demonstration today and I, before class has gone over. Nope. Don't, don't have anyway. That's my brain. So what's the key here? The key is it's not the weight that the dam has to hold. It's the pressure, which is just a function of the depth. So it doesn't matter if you have a big lake, you know, like say Lake Mead or a small lake, like, Holmes Lake. It only matters the depth. And of course, Holmes Lake is what? 10 feet deep. So it probably doesn't need much of a, okay, I'm minimizing it. For the people of Southwestern, Holmes Lake is this tiny little puddle that I live next to. I moved here and I didn't know what to call it. And I was sternly told that in these parts, we call those small things lakes. It's <laughs> as good as we get. Yes, it is. We have lots of man-made lakes here. Anytime there's an off ramp on a freeway. Okay, atmospheric <laughs> pressure. I've said before, I believe, what causes the atmospheric pressure that's pushing on all of us right now? It's the weight of all of the air above us. So if you were to go outside where we don't have a ceiling above me, and you were to just take a column going from your head all the way up to where the atmosphere is thin enough to be negligible and measure the weight of all of that air. Well, now, first thing you would not be able to do is say the weight is mass times gravity. Why would that not work? Because, Rachel? I still didn't hear you. There isn't a mass. Well, there, there is a mass for the air there. Yeah, <laughs> she's like, wow. There is a mass for that air, but the acceleration of gravity, G, was a constant only if you're on the surface of the Earth. And if you go up there in the high atmosphere, the acceleration of gravity is going to be dropping. And so you have to be a little more careful. Use the equation force of gravity is capital G mass 1 mass 2 over radius squared and integrate to get the weight of that. But if you were to add it all up, the weight of the column of air above a one meter squared, now I said a little circle, but to make it easy, textbook shows one meter squared area comes out to be about 100,000 newtons. You don't think of air as having that much weight, but of course you go up, there's a lot there. And so the pressure is the force over area, so that should be, and I'll put the number that's here, 1.01 times 10 to the fifth newtons, divided by the area of one meter squared, and so that's 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth units of newtons per meter squared. 
Notice the units there for pressure, Newton per meter squared. It's force over area. Because we use pressure a lot, we have a new name for a derived unit that's called the Pascal, PA for short. So one Pascal is defined as one Newton per meter squared. So that means the pressure of the atmosphere, and I went to more digit, I only went to one more digit. The pressure of one atmosphere is 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. Now that's a standard atmosphere. As you probably know, atmospheric pressure does fluctuate. So that's the standard atmosphere. Other units that we use for pressure, because we use a lot of units for pressure, not just one. The SI unit, the standard unit is the Pascal. The atmosphere is not standard, but it's used a lot. The bar, if you listen to weather reports, they'll say the pressure is, you know, this is many bars or something. The bar is just saying, well, we have times 10 to the fifth Pascals every time we read the atmospheric pressure. So let's just call the bar for barometer, the pressure of 10 to the fifth Pascals. So then I can just say 1.013 bars instead of having to say 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. So it's just an abbreviation in terms. So the bar, nothing super special. Then we have the tor. Now, tor, short for Torricelli. When I was in high school and we learned about this unit, we just called it millimeters of mercury. And before we get too far into today's lecture, we will get to why this is a convenient unit of measurement, but TOR is just another name for millimeters of mercury. And if you understand where it comes from, it'll make more sense. So I'm gonna hold off on describing TOR anymore till we get to the example with it. And finally, PSI. Now, once again, going back to when I was a child, when you put air in your bicycle tire, you know, I knew I was filling it up to, you know, 65 PSI. And I would just say 65 pounds because I was ignorant that way, right? But it's not 65 pounds. Pounds is a unit of, what, what is that measuring? Of weight or force. Well, if I'm putting in air pressure, pounds isn't the right unit. It's pounds per square inch is what I was putting, 65 pounds per square inch of pressure. And so, the PSI stands for pounds per square inch. And yeah, when I was a kid and I looked at the sidewall and it said PSI, I thought that that was a Greek letter and I just figured there's more for me to learn. Turns out it wasn't the Greek letter psi at all. Um, so on the left-hand side, I have the conversion factors between these units and Pascal's. On the right-hand side there in red, I have what one atmosphere is in each one of these units. So the pressure that's on you in a typical day, 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals, or one atmosphere, or 1.013 bars, or 760 tor, 760 millimeters of mercury, or 14.7, that's a seven, pounds per square inch. So those are standards for air pressure. Now, if you think about it, just taking my hand here, how much area does the top of my hand have? Just give me a rough number. Obviously, it's not going to be the correct number, but a rough number. Nine square inches. Okay, about nine square inches. So if I have nine square inches here in my hand, that means the air pressure from the air above is making a force into my hand. So on the top of my hand, that's a downward force of 14.7 pounds per square inch times nine square inches. Nine times 14.7 is what? 132.3. So if I just hold my hand out like this, I'm holding up 133 pounds essentially because of that air pressure. So you know I'm totally burly, right? Why is it just no sweat for me? And for you too, obviously. Because there's the same amount of pressure going up on your hand. There's air pressure underneath as well, and that's making an upward force it's the same area on the bottom as it is on the top. And the air pressure, the change in height here is, you know, let's say two centimeters. And the density of air is what 1.27 um, kilograms per meter cubed. 
it's not a very big change in pressure going two centimeters difference height in air. So the pressure is almost exactly the same. It actually would be a little bit higher in the bottom, which means that the air pressure is actually helping to hold my hand up, making it so it takes actually less force from me than it would if I was in vacuum. The difference is minuscule. But if you do it in water, you notice the difference. You notice that it's easier in water to hold your hand out than it is in air. Why is it easier in water? Because the water is more dense. The water is like 800 times more dense. So that means the increase in pressure in two centimeters is no longer completely negligible. And so the water is pushing up with enough force that depending on who you are, your arm might just be neutrally buoyant. That is, it just sits there and floats. You don't have to exert any strength because the downward force and the upward force is balance. Okay, Pascal's principle. The unit for pressure, Pascal, you know Pascal has to be associated with fluid things and pressure. And Pascal's principle, basically, there's a lot of different ways of saying it, but what it basically says is, if you have a continuous still fluid, then the pressure will be the same at the same elevation. Basically what that's saying is, let's take this picture, not meant for this, but it works. Let's say I take a little block right here. There's gonna be pressure one pushing on it like that, and pressure two pushing on it like that. Those pressures are pushing opposite each other. If those pressures are unequal, what's gonna to happen to that little block of water? It's going to move because if the pressures are unequal, since the areas are equal, the pressures are unequal, the side with the higher pressure is going to have a higher force pushing. There'll be a net force and it will move. So Pascal's principle says if you're in equilibrium, you know, you have just still water and it's continuous, you can't have a break. You know, I have a, a tank here and a tank here and there's no connection. Well, that doesn't work. But then if you're at the same elevation, you're going to have to have the same pressure. Otherwise, the pressure difference would simply move the water until you reach the same pressure. So that's Pascal's principle. And Pascal's principle is very useful for a type of simple machine. So this right here is a type of simple machine. It is a hydraulic machine, one that uses a fluid. But what you are allowed to do here is you can make two pistons with different areas. And using Pascal's principle, the pressure at the same level would be the same value. But if one has a bigger area for the piston, what does that tell you about the force it's gonna, that the fluid's gonna put on the piston? The bigger one's gonna have the bigger force. One will be smaller, but it'd be the one with the smaller piston that has the smaller force. So we use this for things like you go to the you know, car shop, they lift up your car so they can walk underneath. And when they do that, they have something like this, a hydraulic ram that lifts the car. And for that hydraulic ram, they're gonna have a force they apply to a small piston to make pressure. And then that pressure is gonna be distributed through the fluid to put roughly equal pressure on the hydraulic ram with a very big area. And so if you just say pressure one equals pressure two, that means force one over area one equals force two over area two. Now, if you want to be technically correct, you don't follow the red arrows the textbook put on this picture. Because what direction is the force that the water is going to put on the left-hand side or the fluid on that green cylinder or whatever, piston, what direction is the force the water is going to put? Up. Up. Right, so I really should have force one is pointing up there. And what about the force that the water puts on the other ram? The force puts on the other green cylinder or whatever, piston. It's going to be up again because it always goes into the surface. So since the water is touching on the bottom, the force two is also pointing up. So why did they use different pictures? 
because they said, well, we're going to call force one the force that you apply to piston one. And we're going to call force two the force that piston two applies to your load. So they named them things other than the force the water is applying. But if you want to be technical with this equation, it's the forces the water is applying, so it's upward on both sides. Newton's third law says that if that piston is in equilibrium, the downward force has to equal the upward force. And so you can use Newton's third law to relate their force picture to mine. But the important thing here is then that you have force two, the force that you're going to apply is equal to force one times area two over area one. So this is a simple machine. It's going to magnify forces. And what would the theoretical mechanical advantage be for this machine? That is force two over force one. I'm just going to put MA for mechanical advantage. What should that equal for this simple machine? I heard somebody say very softly. Aaron, is that you? It should be greater than one for sure. Otherwise, it's not a very useful, simple machine. Area two over area one. And so it's a simple machine that allows you to multiply forces just like any other simple machine. It doesn't multiply work. So you're going to have to move the small cylinder much more than you move the big cylinder, which is actually easy to understand because the volume of fluid that moves through this little connector you know, it's the same as the volume that decreases on one side, the same as it increases on the other. But the change in volume is going to be the area times the distance it moves. So the one with the big area is going to have a much smaller distance it moves. Okay, now let's look at the picture on the right here. This is a very practical application. And it involves not just the simple machine we talked about, but another simple machine. So when you look at this, you have a brake pedal. And then... It pushes here, so here's your first cylinder. Erase that there, but there's the first cylinder. That's a small cylinder. Then you have the fluid going through a little tube, and then you have the large cylinder here. I'm going to erase that again, but just outlining where it is. So when you look at this, you should see some Manawa. <laughs> you should see two simple machines. What's the first simple machine you see? Lever. The lever. You have a lever here. And so in this picture, you can see that with the lever, you have a torque balance situation. You're going to have one force applied at 0.2 meters, one force applied at 0 0.04 meters. So your mechanical advantage is going to be 20 over 4, or five times mechanical advantage because of the way the pedal is set up. So I push on that pedal with a force of 100 newtons. How much force am I applying down there on the ram? What is F1 if the force of the foot is 100 newtons? Since answers aren't flying, I'm going to write equations. We're going to have force 1 times that distance 0 0.040 meters equals 100 newtons times 0 0.20 meters. It's going to be 500. So I'm already applying a much stronger force just because of that lever. But then I have a hydraulic ram, and the first hydraulic ram has a diameter of 0 0.05 centimeters. The second hydraulic ram has a diameter of 2.5 centimeters. So now I'm going to use this relationship up above to find force 2. So force 2 will be force 1, 500 newtons, times area 2 over area 1. Well, what's the equation for the area of a circle? Okay, it's pi r squared. Now, to make our lives a little bit simpler, I'm going to put in terms of diameter. Since radius is diameter divided by 2, you square that, 
and you have diameter squared over four. So pi diameter squared over four So radius or diameter two is 2.5 centimeters. Radius one, 0 0.5. Now we don't need calculators for this because the numbers are simple. The pi's cancel, the four's cancel. I have 2.5 squared over 0.5 squared. What's the easy way to do that? Bring them inside the same square. So this is equal to 500 newtons times 2.5 centimeters over 0 0.5 centimeters quantity squared. 2.5 over 0.5 is 5. 5 squared is 25. 25 times 500 is going to be... So I'm putting a really, really large force on the piston there. And what's that going to do? These are your standard um, drum brakes. And you're pushing these drums, well, these pads into the brake drum to cause friction. And we know that the force of friction is proportional to the force normal. And so when I push that in, I'm going to have force normal equal and opposite to the force that's pushing into the surface to keep my brake pad from going into the <clears throat> drum. So the force normal is going to be 125, no, 12,500 newtons. And then the force of friction will be the coefficient of friction between the steel of the brake drum and whatever material asbestos you're using in that brake pad times the force normal. So there's a nice practical example of using Pascal's principle, right? Obviously it's used every day. If you have disc brakes, it's the same idea, except for you have a rotor and your drum is pushing or your, yeah, still a drum is pushing out. And then you just have levers that go in because of that pushing out. So it still is going to cause friction to increase proportional to how hard you pushed on it. You might have a power assisted brake where it actually increases the pressure over what you pushed, but it's still the same. So here's a practical diagram for the pump that's used to lift a car. And I just want you to see the practical because sometimes whether you're using the little hand pump that goes under the center of the car and raises the car or you know going to the shop and they're using it an electric motor to do the pump, it's still basically the same idea. You have a tank that's filled with oil because they use oil for their hydraulics. You have two one-way valves. Fluid can go through the valves this way, but can't go the other way. Just like in your hearts, you know, you have the, the mitral and the tricuspid valves. They only allow the fluid to go one way. You have this pump here, like the heart again. I mean, that's why you have the valves and the hearts. It's pretty much the same thing. When you push down on this lever, the fluid's going to have to go that way. And you increase the pressure under the car. Car goes up. When you want to lower the car, you have a separate valve that allows oil to escape back into the tank. And it doesn't take a lot of force pushing on that pump to raise the car, but it takes a whole lot of times going up and down on the pump to raise the car very much because you have a simple machine that you have to do a lot of motion with a little force to get a little motion with a lot of force. Okay, our first clicker question, which you can answer now. A hydraulic lift has a hydraulic ram cylinder with cross-sectional area of 0 0.250 meters squared. What pressure must a hydraulic pump provide to lift a 30 Newton pickup? I'll just write.
There's a picture. Kind of. Doesn't have any arrows, doesn't show what pressure is, but you Okay, about five more seconds here. All right. What we got for our answers were, hey, stop. <laughs> that was not ideal. Four, four, 47. <laughs> it's now asking the question again. Um, that's going to cause me a problem. 4447, and I didn't get the last two because it moved on. Don't know what went wrong there, but it failed. Okay, so, oh, don't answer that yet. <laughs> I don't think there's a way to clear this. Well, let's just stay with this. So we had 47 people that said C, a very large proportion. And so Elizabeth... Bautista, tell us your answer and how you came to that answer. Sorry, man. Um, I chose the unit is Pascal, and Pascal is Newton um, meter squared. Over per meter squared. Okay. But all three of them had those units. Oh, yeah. And so I divided the 30,000 by the 0.25, and that gave me the answer. Okay. That's right. We had the pressure to lift it. We're going to have to lift a force equal to the weight of the truck, so we know that force is going to have to be 30,000 newtons. The area is 0 0.250 meters squared, so you just take – 30,000 divided by, by 2.250, which is the same as multiplying by four, and you get 120,000. Another, well, yeah, that, that's, that's good enough. Thank you for the good answer, Elizabeth. You go as Liz, don't you? Yeah. Well, moving on. <laughs> the communication is hard. How do we measure pressure? Here are two different types of pressure gauges. Here's an example called an aneroid where you have pressure that goes into essentially bellows. And the more pressure you put in there, the more force you're putting on the edges of the bellows, right, on this surface here and this surface here. And so it gets pushed open. You have a spring that's opposing it over here. And so the amount that the spring compresses will be proportional to the force that's pushing on the bellows. So you have a direct then correlation, the amount that the spring moves, which we read by this indicator arrow, is proportional to the pressure. So that's a, a simple method to read the pressure. This one over here takes a little more thought. This is called a manometer. So the manometer works by having tubes with a fluid in it. Now, when we moved into this building, I had a nice mercury manometer. Unfortunately, it leaked. It leaked. We spent a quarter of a million dollars to remediate this little leak of mercury. And the company that we hired, which we'll call Safe Harbors, they didn't do anything for like two months. And by the time they came in to work on it, there was no mercury left, but we still had to pay them a quarter of a million dollars to do nothing. So we don't have any mercury things in this building because of that. But the manometer is used to measure pressure. If you just have a little U-tube as shown in figure A here, and both sides are open to atmosphere, both sides are going to have atmospheric pressure pushing on them. And so you'll have equal pressures pushing down on both sides, and the, the fluid will do exactly what you'd expect it will just be at the same level on both sides. 
because you know Pascal's principle says that if you're in the fluid, the pressure has to be the same at the same level. So the pressure there and there has to be the same. You go up and you get to atmospheric pressure, that's also going to have to be at the same height. So with the manometer, if the two levels are the same, the pressures are the same. Here, this little Mickey Mouse thing has been attached. And what's happened? The manometer doesn't have the same level on both sides. But if I use Pascal's principle, I still know that the pressure on the left side has to be the same as the pressure on the right. And so I measure this height difference on the side that in this case is open. And I can determine what the pressure difference is for that column. What's the equation that tells us the pressure difference? Don't have it memorized? It's the density of the fluid times acceleration of gravity multiplied by the height. And so the pressure difference between those two places is rho gh, where rho is the density of the fluid I put in there. Well, what's the pressure on the top of this column? What's the pressure right here? Right. So if that's atmospheric pressure, what's happened to the pressure as I go down into the fluid? It's increasing. So the pressure down here at the bottom is going to be atmospheric pressure plus the change in pressure. So atmospheric pressure plus the density of the fluid times G times the height. Now, you know, having to add that pressure atmosphere gets to be annoying. So we invent a new measurement of pressure, something we call the gauge pressure. And the gauge pressure means that it's with reference to a standard, a gauge. So when we say gauge, we're not talking about a, a device. We're talking about a standard. And so the gauge pressure... Unless you are told otherwise, the gauge is always going to be atmospheric pressure for gauge pressure. So the gauge pressure is going to be the absolute pressure, which is what I've been calculating everywhere up to this point, minus atmospheric pressure. And so with this manometer, the gauge pressure, this was absolute then, pressure gauge is equal to pressure atmosphere plus rho g h minus pressure atmosphere that just becomes rho g h so with the manometer your pressure difference between your gauge and whatever you're measuring is just that rho g h so you measure the height and you say, okay, it's that height times G times the density of the material. And this is where the whole idea of the tor comes about. You're measuring the height and the pressure is proportional to that height. And so the tor is a measurement, it's millimeters of mercury. And so for a tor, you're just measuring what H is for the actual pressure. And I have a picture with a barometer, I think, on the next slide. So I won't go further on the tour until I get to that slide. So that's how we can use this to measure the pressure. Now, notice on figure B, the side that was open to atmosphere was higher. That meant that the pressure of that little Mickey Mouse thing was higher than atmospheric pressure. In, in figure C, it's lower on the side open to the atmosphere. So what does that tell you? That which one's higher? Atmospheric pressure. That I, atmospheric pressure is higher and it's lower in my <laughs> vacuum sealed peanut container. So you can determine which one's the higher and lower just by looking at which side has higher and lower fluid. What kind of fluids do we use in manometers? Well, as I told you, we prefer to use mercury. Think of reasons. Why would we like to use mercury in our manometer? 
okay? Because it has a large density. The density of mercury is something like 13.6 times the density of water. So that means your manometer would have to be 13.6 times larger if you're using water than mercury to measure the same pressure difference. Now, if you want to measure small pressure, then water's fine for that regard. And so in my house, I have a little radon remediation system. And what it does is it makes a pressure that's slightly lower in my floor than there is in the house. And so I have a little manometer. One side goes into the below the floor part. One goes into the house. And by looking at the difference in water level, I can see what the pressure difference is. Now, many times we have to have our blood pressure measured. Ever since I was your age, my blood pressure has been marginally high. So I've had much more experience with the sphygmo manometer than a lot of people. As an EMT, I had to learn to use it. Um, just as a point of reference, when you're actually in an ambulance with a real life patient, it's a lot harder. <laughs> in our training, we had to do it, but it was easier with our training. And you know, my brother's up there weaving back and forth, but I'm not worried. First real patient, <laughs> I couldn't get her blood pressure. It was terrible. Um, <laughs> so why do I bring this up? Of course, not for my EMT training, but for the fact that this device right here is doing the things that we've seen. This has a, an aneroid, which means that it's the kind that has the bellows and the spring. And it's measuring the pressure You've used this little hand pump to pump up the pressure and then it measures it using, whoops, using a device like that. Or if you go to some doctor's offices, they will actually have a mercury manometer on the wall. And so instead of using this to measure the pressure, they will actually use a manometer. Uh, one more thing about the manometers. I said one reason is the density. Another one is the vapor pressure. Mercury has a very low vapor pressure. There's very little amount of evaporation going on with mercury. Water has a much higher vapor pressure, does a lot more evaporation. So we would prefer to have a constant amount of mercury in our manometer, not have it constantly you know, disappearing and whatnot. So that's another good reason to go with mercury, and especially when we use a barometer. So here's a picture of the barometer. So we have mercury down there in the barometer, a pool of mercury. And to make the manometer, or the manometer, the barometer, you start by taking this tube that's closed at one end and you have to get all of the air out. Now there's an easy way and a hard way to get all of the air out. What's the hard way? What's the obvious way to get the air out? Yeah, you pump it out. That's the hard way. It works, but there's a real easy way as well. Just think about having a cup. If I want to fill the cup with water, right, because I'm going to take out all the air and then fill it with mercury, the easiest thing to do is just to completely submerge it with the opening up, in which case it will just naturally fill with the fluid, then put the end down in the fluid so it stays in the fluid, lift the other end up, no air can get in. So it's not super difficult to make the barometer. You just have to be a little smart about how you fill it and turn it up. So you started with this barometer tube, 100% filled with mercury. And you make this tube so it's something like 85 centimeters tall. Why 85 centimeters? Well, because that's more than 76 centimeters. By approximately nine by my count. Why is that important? Well, we learned that pressure difference, delta P is equal to rho GH. Well, if we have one atmosphere pressure, that's equal to 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And so if I go from one pressure and then the pressure goes down, one atmospheric pressure, then the pressure goes down as I go up in the column of mercury. The place where I will get to a pressure of zero, I can calculate. It'll be a pressure difference of 
1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals, which would be the density times g times the height. So the height should be Um, did that wrong. It's exactly the opposite of what I wrote. There we go. So that'd be 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals divided by the density of mercury, which is, is 13.6 grams per centimeter cubed or times 10 to the third kilograms per meter cubed. And then G, of course, 9.80 meters per second squared. And so let's do our calculation there, somebody with calculator. What do you get? Um, I think I did something wrong, but I got 0. 0.7600, so I got that. Yeah. Okay, 0. 0.7600 meters. Notice I had everything in the SI unit, so that's in meters. So my column of mercury, if I go from atmosphere up to zero, it will go 0. 0.76 meters. Well, what happens to the pressure if I go above that? Pressure is always pushing out right? That means you can't have a negative pressure because a negative pressure would be pulling in. So what happens when you reach zero pressure? We call that a vacuum. And all you have is the volume for that zero pressure can get bigger or smaller. And so at the top of this tube, I should have fluid that only goes up what we just calculated here, 0 0.760 meters. And then above that, it'll just be a vacuum. It's not air. It's nothing, because a vacuum means nothing in there. If we put water in there, we'd have water vapor in there. And the pressure would actually be a little bit bigger than zero because of the water vapor in there. But with mercury, it has very low vapor pressure. It's pretty much a vacuum. Now, what happens if the air pressure outside increases? So if it goes from 1.013 to 1.018, just made up a number. I don't know if that happens. What would happen to that tube, the height of the tube? It would go up because the pressure went up. And since our relationship was the height was change in pressure over density times G, then it would go up as the pressure outside goes up. Pressure outside goes down, it drops. And so that's how we measure barometric pressure. And you might realize that 0 0.760 meters is equal to 760.0 millimeters. And so that's where we get that one atmosphere is 760 torr, because the torr is a millimeter of mercury. It's the pressure difference if you have a column of mercury that's 760 millimeters tall. If we want to use water instead of mercury, what would have changed in this calculation? Yeah, instead of 13.6 times 10 to the third on the bottom, it would have been one times 10 to the third on the bottom, which means that the height that you would need for water would be 13.6 times higher. So go ahead and do that for me real quick because I know we have some scuba divers here. So if I take my 0 0.7600 and multiply it by 13.6, get 10.34 meters. What do you learn in scuba diving, Jordan? In atmosphere, your pressure goes up by an atmosphere, how much depth? Uh, uh, six, no, I forget, actually. It should be, they should teach you somewhere in the ballpark of 30 feet. That's 33. 33. Because it's 10 point, what was it, 4, 6? 10.34. 10.34, I was really not close. 10.34 meters is one atmosphere if it's pure water at 3.96 degrees Celsius. 
um, let's say four degrees Celsius, because I actually know that's where you round to. And so it's a rough number there of, you know, 10 meters and you said 33 feet for the pressure difference to increase by that amount by an atmosphere. Okay, our next clicker question. Please help everything work right this time. You, you can answer now, it's open. So two good reasons to use mercury in barometers. Remember, you do need to press enter for your answer to be registered. Okay, about five more seconds and I'm gonna go on. Okay, so we had 22, 33, 38, zero, and two. Now I'm just going to start at the top. I'm not going to ask students on these. I'm just going to start at the top and go through the reasons. So number one, mercury expands rapidly with temperature. That would be a bad reason for using mercury because that would say that your barometer would change its reading just if it gets hotter or colder, regardless of what happens to the air pressure. So we would not want that. We would want something that expands very slowly with change in temperature, right? So, I mean, if you could choose, you'd take, you know, something like Pyrex. There's actually some things that are better than Pyrex in that regard, but something that expands very little with change in temperature. Mercury has a high density? Absolutely. Because that means you don't have to have as big a barometer. Mercury has a low vapor pressure? Once again, absolutely, because that means the vacuum at the top really is pretty much a vacuum. Mercury conducts electricity well? A true statement but that's not going to matter for your barometer. But of course, if you want to make a switch that will set off your bomb when it tips, well, then mercury is a good choice because it conducts electricity. That's why they make their mercury switches, right? Somebody tips the switch, mercury flows across and connects the two contacts and electricity flows through and go kablooey. Mercury conducts heat well, once again, wouldn't matter to us. Wow, I was even going to do a problem with the Maltese Falcon after this, but I guess we won't do the Maltese Falcon problem. Buoyancy. We know that if we throw a piece of wood into the water, it floats. And we know that if we throw a chunk of iron into the water, it sinks. And buoyancy is the reason for the floating. We've learned that pressure increases with depth. So if we imagine having a cylinder in water so this is an imaginary cylinder in the water it's just all water but imagine there's a cylinder the pressure down at the bottom is increased by the density of the water times g times the depth so i'm going to have more force pushing up on the bottom than i'll have pushing down the top and we call that the buoyant force now for this water the water's density of course is the same as the stuff around and so the weight of the water pushing down is going to balance that and the water stays normal. But let's talk about what Archimedes discovered. So I'm going to go back to the pictures at the very beginning of this, the first slide. The story goes that the king, and I don't even know the king's name because that's not physics. The king had a goldsmith make a crown for him. And after he got the crown back, he just got that feeling that he had been cheated. And I don't know about you, but I agree with the king. I hate to get cheated. I would rather just call off the whole deal rather than get a bargain if I got cheated. And so the king wanted Arch Archimedes 
to tell him if this guy had cheated him or not. But don't destroy the crown if he didn't cheat because we don't want to, you know, destroy the crown. So Archimedes sits down. He does the obvious things. The first thing that any reasonable person would do is measure the mass. Is it the same as the mass of gold the king gave the goldsmith? The mass was right. And then Archimedes is like, what do I do? What will I do? Oh, servants, draw me a bath. And he takes a bath. And it's a picture of Archimedes in the bathtub. But when he gets in the bathtub, he notices that when he gets in the bathtub, the water overflows and runs out. And he thinks about it. He says, well, now, why the water overflow when I ran out? Because my body has volume. And it displaced a volume equal to you know, the volume of my body that was underwater. But then I can measure the way that he jumps out of the tub saying, Eureka, because he found it. And he goes and he says, I can do this. So he takes the crown. He measures, of course, the way the crown outside of water, puts it in the water, measures how much water came out. Knowing the density of water, he can then calculate the volume of the water. He says the volume it displaced was equal to the volume of the crown. So I know its weight and its volume. I can calculate the density. If the density is not that of gold, we got cheated. And the story goes, it wasn't real gold. So then they destroyed the crown. They found that he had taken little plants and molded them into the framework for the crown and then just put gold around it and kept the extra gold so the weight was the same. Okay, we're out of time on this, so we will pick up with buoyancy Monday.